What is the book of Revelation all about? Have you got your Bible open to Revelation chapter 1? Go to chapter 2, go back to chapter 1. Young people, if you'd been a part of the church there, uh, one of those seven churches in Asia, and all of a sudden the, letter, uh, we get the, the message comes, John has gotten a message from, from Jesus Christ, and it's a message written to this very church. I wonder if you would have paid any attention to it. Can you imagine being a teenager in the church there, and somebody standing up and reading. Not everybody could read in that world, by the way. Look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed is he that reads and those that hear. And so there'd have to be those individuals that were educated enough to read the book. And there'd be those who were not educated, but they could understand the words of it. You know what you would understand about this book? Look at chapter 1, verse 1, and underline these things in your mind. You'll hear me say this a lot several times in that Sunday morning class as we talk about this. You'll hear me say it in the introduction probably of every one of the seven churches. But look at the second word in, the, in, in, in this very book. In the Greek, it's the first word. You know what it is? It's the word revelation. We have the attitude that there are 65 books in the Bible that uh, are understandable, and there's one book that nobody would ever be able to understand. That's not what God says. You know what a revelation is. You define what revelation is, and then you understand. You'll understand what this book is all about. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, uh, which God gave unto him, to, to, uh, uh, through his servant John, to show unto his servants. And so it's a revelation. Who's it written to? It's written to those, sub, the, to those servants. Who are those servants? Look at verse 11. Verse 11 says... What you see, you write it in a book, and you send it to these seven churches in Asia. So John is on the Isle of Patmos. He receives a revelation. I know you're not supposed to define a word by using the word itself. You know what a revelation is? It's something that is revealed. It's not something that's hidden. It's not something that's secret. It is a revelation, and it's written to those seven churches in Asia. Now then, it is written to those seven churches in Asia, and the Bible says in chapter 1, verse 1, He sent and signified it. That word signify in the Greek can, liter can be more clearly understood if you'll look at the word signify and put a hyphen after the N and after the I. Look at the word signify in the Bible. You know what He did? He sent and signified. That's what he did. It's not literal. And so when you read about dragons in heaven, and when you, when you read about uh, a beast coming out, when you read about the woman on the moon, I know you've heard of the man on the moon, but the Bible talks about the woman on the moon. You need to understand that's a symbol of something. It's not literal. It's not a book made of uh, like a historical narrative. It's a totally different kind of book. And then he said, it's a revelation. Uh, he sent to signify unto his servants, Things which must shortly happen. If you'd remember, remember the church, um, you know, so, uh, so suppose you were there and you heard these very words read. What would you expect this book to be around? It would be a revelation to those seven churches in signs of things which were about to happen, things that were going to shortly happen. And so many people, when they study this book, absolutely ignore what the very book says in the very, very beginning. Look at verse 3. We looked at that, we quoted it a moment ago, the ones that read and those that hear and those that keep the words of this book. For why? For the time is at hand. And so we're going to talk about that in that study in our Sunday morning class. But you need to write that on your heart and remember it. This book is a revelation. How do you know that? That's what it says. It's a revelation to his servants, those servants to those seven churches in Asia. How do I know? That's what the text says. It's a book in symbolic language. How do I know that? Because that's what the book says. He sent and showed by signs. It's a revelation to seven churches in Asia in signs of things which must shortly happen. How do I know that? Because that's what the book says. And when many people come to this book and ignore that, you can go everywhere in your imagination, wherever it wants to take you, and you'll be able to find whatever you want to find in, in your application of the book. Now then, there were more churches than these seven churches in Asia. The Bible says that while Paul 
was in Ephesus for three years, all that were in Asia heard the word. And why the Lord picked these seven churches, I have no, have no idea why these seven churches were picked. But it is interesting to, to look at those churches. And that's what I want us to do. I, I want us to look and put, go ahead and put that slide on the screen of Revelation chapter 2. And this is the only slide we've got. We've got some words highlighted in yellow to emphasize some of the things that are in this. But it's a very, very short letter. It's the shortest of the letters to all of the seven churches in Asia. The church in Smyrna. What do we know about Smyrna? Well, from, from secular history, we learned a lot about it. one of the larger cities uh, uh, in, in, in Asia. Ephesus had, had more notoriety, but Smyrna rivaled it and excelled above Ephesus in, in, several, in several different ways. Imagine being uh, uh, th that city there. There is a, it's there on the Aegean Sea, and there's a, there's a, a bay that comes up, and it goes right up to, to the edge of Smyrna. There's a river that comes off the mountains that are there in Asia Minor, and so that's why that city was built. You look at, look at where cities have been built in America. It's, all, it's almost always where there are rivers that come into the sea, especially before the invention of, of the locomotive, the trains and everything. It was their form of commerce. And so it was a very, very beautiful city. There was one city that, that ran all the way from the harbor, all the way, all the way back uh, to, uh, uh, to the mountains as, as you got, on, got away from, from the seashore. And, and it was called the Golden Street. If you walk down the Golden Streets, and especially as more as you got back to the backside of that, there were temples to all, all of the Roman gods and goddesses. And so we've got to understand, this book is written to people in Smyrna where there were many, many pagans that were there. In fact, uh, there were temples to Apollo, to As Asclepius, uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and, uh, and all the way back, and at the back part of that city, on one of the mountainous ledge there, was the Temple of Zeus. That's the chief of the gods, you need to understand. And so it was a, it was a very, very religious city. It was a very rich city. The people in it were really, really wealthy. So had you lived in that, er in, in that area, you would have been rich. If you'd been a Christian in that city, you look on the screen, the Lord says, I know, I know about your poverty. But uh, it, it was called, uh, it was called the, the glory of Asia. I don't know, you remember the CB radios way back yonder whenever, you know, uh, there were these cities that had some particular name. I'm not sure what nickname uh, West Palm Beach had. I, I'm, not, I am not, uh, I'm not sure. I remember Birmingham, because of all the uh, steel factories that's there, was called Smoke City. One trucker would say to another, where are you going? I'm going to Smoke City, Dothan, Alabama, Circle City, because it, was a, it had a bypass around the city, all the way around the city, way back before there were interstates that uh, surrounded cities. And so I'm going to Circle City. I'm going to Rocket City. That's, that's Huntsville, Alabama. In, in, it, when they described the city of Smyrna, it was called the glory of Asia because it, was, it had some of the most magnificent buildings uh, uh, to, be, to be found anywhere, but it was a very religious city in the sense that there were pagans there. There was a large Jewish population. Let me back, out, back up and point out that the present population of that particular city is over 200,000. So it's really a, still a major city. Ephesus is not that way because the, uh, the, the silt that came down in the river that came into the city of Ephesus has now, pushed, has now pushed the harbor of Ephesus four or five miles away, away from Ephesus itself. And so if you go on one of those cruises and you're going to stop at Ephesus, that ship is not going to go right into the heart of Ephesus. It will be four miles. But that was not the situation because the nature of that, uh, the harbor that was there in Smyrna, it was a very, very deep port. And so it was a place where there was really, really a lot, uh, a lot of commerce. Now let's begin looking at, at what is stated here. It begins by saying, the angel of the church, or to the angel of the church at Smyrna, write these things. And the immediate question you have is, who is that angel? Let me stop long enough to point out the fact that we may not be able to understand everything that's in it. I'm sure those members of the church, 
whenever they received this letter, understood who this angel of the church was. The word angelos simply means a messenger. And so uh, uh, we usually think of the word angelos, the word angel, as being, you know, you know some individual that has white wings on its back and everything, but it's just a messenger. John the Baptist is called a messenger. The spies that went out and, uh, and spied out the city of Jericho, you know, the, the, uh, uh, were, were, were called angelos. They were angels. They were messengers that went in to spy out Jericho and came back. And so the word does not necessarily refer to heavenly beings. And somebody says, well, do you think it's possible that God may have appointed one angel over every church? Or somebody else, do you think it's possible that this might have been one of the leading men in the church? You know, uh, uh, it could have, been, could have been the preacher that was there. Is this a letter to the preacher that's there? Or is it, and then all of a sudden they'll come up with four or five ideas. Every one of them might be possible. Listen to this. There's no way you can know what that is. And just, 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 I love what Brother Franklin Camp used to say. If God doesn't see fit to tell you what it is, don't make anything up. Just, uh, just accept it that there are things about, I don't know who the angel is. I know that angels, that children have angels that behold their face. The Bible talks about, do not destroy the faith of one of these little ones that believes. Think of those, the faith of those children in that lower classroom area down there. They have an unbelievable faith in God. And, and there are individuals in our educational system who are out to destroy the faith that those little children ha have. And Jesus said, don't you destroy the faith of a little child that believes. In fact, he says, woe to him who destroys the faith of a child that believes. And then he says, for their angels behold the face of my father. And so here are those little children. And it's not that they have a guardian angels. The word their angels is, and the word angels is plural. You need to understand you know, some children take more than one guardian angels, you know. You know the kind of child I'm talking I know that's not you whenever you were young and mischievous, but you might have had four or five trying to keep watching out for you. Nobody knows who they are. And so when you read it, don't worry about it. Here is a letter that was sent by, sent by John to these seven churches. Is it possible that when the letter got there, they gave a copy of, it, of it, this letter and, and these messengers carried these uh, uh, to all the seven churches of Asia? Yes, that's possible. Do you know that that's what happened? No, I do not need to know. And the folks in Smyrna would know exactly what it is. And there are things like that in all of the Bible. Sometimes there are things that are stated that we don't understand, but they wouldn't understand. For example, the man that was withdrawn from in, uh, uh, in Corinth for having his father's wife. What's his name? I don't know, but everybody in Corinth knew who he was. Even those who were pagans uh, knew what his name was. And I don't need to know that and because they would readily understand it. But then he says, write this letter to that church. These things says he, who is the first and last who was dead and came to life. First and the last is what you read back in chapter 1. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha and Omega, you know what those are? They're Greek letters. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. And so the Lord, in describing the fact that He is all-inclusive, I am the Alpha and the Omega. You want to make that in modern English? I'm the A to Z. That's exactly what He is. And, and so, uh, but whenever we talk about Him being the first, in, in a sense, and because He mentions the resurrection, He's the firstborn from the dead. But He was the first in the sense that He was there at the creation. I am the first and the last. And then he says to those suffering saints in, in, uh, in, in Smyrna, he says to them, I was dead. And in the Greek, remember the Greek tense, there is that way of saying in the Greek, it was and it happened and it happened and it happened and it happened again. And there is that way in the Greek that you can say, it happened one time. And in the Greek it says, I was dead. They put me to death. But now I am alive. I am alive. And so that's the one who is sending this message from them. And you can just imagine, if you remember the church in Smyrna, and you get this letter, it's not a letter from John. 
It is a letter from Jesus. You know, sometimes in the red letter Bible, sometimes they have trouble deciding whether it ought to put things in red letters or not because sometimes it may be difficult. Here's what it ought to be. Here's what it ought to be. This John is on the Isle of Patmos, and the Lord says, Write this to, the, to this church at Smyrna. Write these words. And then he says, I know your works. There are seven churches in Asia. Can I give you a way of remembering the names of those seven churches? I stick things in my head in uh, unusual ways, and some people just are horrified at the way I remember things. But I love my way of remembering them better than your way of forgetting them. You know what ESP is, not ESPN, extrasensory perception? I want to use ESP to help you memorize the seven churches in Asia. Are you ready? You got it? Did you, anybody get it? I got E, I got S, I got P. What about Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamos? That's the name of those of three of the first three churches. That's ESP. Now then, you get ESP. Can I give you the next three using TSP? Thyatira, Sardis, and Philadelphia. And everybody knows that last church in those churches is Laodicea. And so you've got, here are these seven churches. And so here's this letter, and the Lord says to every one of these seven churches, I know your works. You might want to look in chapter 2 and look in verse 1 when he writes to the, elder, to the angel of the church at Ephesus. Guess what he says? I know your works. When he writes to Smyrna, guess what he says? I know your works. When he writes to Pergamos, he says, I know your works. When he writes to Thyatira, I know your works. When he, when, uh, uh, he writes to Sardis, I know your works. When he, when he writes to Philadelphia, I know your works. And when he writes to Laodicea, I know your works. And if he wrote a letter to Palm Beach Lakes, guess what he'd say? I know what's going on there. And that's wonderful. That God knows what's going on. And the, these, these saints were really, really suffering. And that's indicated by, that, by the word that's on the screen. I know your works and I know your tribulation. In the Greek, the word tribulation is interesting. It literally means pressure. And the picture is of a man lying on the ground, and there's this big boulder, and there are a group of men that are taking this boulder, and they're rolling this heavy boulder up, up his body and, and, and pushing the life out of his body. Now, that's not literal. That sort of signifies, is that a picture that I just drew? Did you, did you get some symbolism whenever the Lord, where he says, I know the tribulation that you are under. He's going to tell us in a minute where it's coming from. It's actually coming, it, coming from, from two sources. Look down in verse 10 whenever he says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. That helps us understand what was happening in these seven churches in Asia. There were some really amazing spiritual struggles that they were having. And you may be having a spiritual struggle right this very minute. There may be something that's happening in your life. And the pressure that is in your life, it is sometimes more than you, you can think, well, it's more than I can, stand, I can stand. Have you ever been in that situation where the Lord, the Bible says, God will not allow you to be, to, to be tempted above that, with that which you are able, but will with every uh, temptation provide a way of escape. Have you ever th thought, I'm at my limits, and I think I'm beyond my limits. Maybe God doesn't know what my limits is. I know your works, and I know the tribulation that you're under. And so whenever they were in their workplace, whenever they might have not even been able to have a job because they were Christians, we'll talk sometimes as we study the book of Revelation about the fact that if you were not a member of a trade guild, somewhat like a union situation in America, a closed shop type of thing, if you were not a member of a trade guild, you could not buy or sell or get gain. And the problem is, to be a member of a trade, uh, to be a member of a trade guild, every one of those trade guilds were devoted to a god. And so they'd begin their union meetings, they'd begin their trade meetings by pouring out sacrifices. And so all the people that were in that particular trade, they would the Christians would have to be faced with. Can I pour out this oblation, this drink offering to this God? 
You're talking about tribulation. That's where they were. And then about the fact that they were going to be cast into prison, that they were being blasphemed, and that they were really, really poor because he says, I know your poverty. The word poverty is, is not, uh, is not uh, highlighted in this, but perhaps it should be. There are two Greek words for poverty. One of them describes a man who, uh, who's living day to day. You can imagine somebody that is a day worker. I remember when I was in India, the Indian brethren were saying, we get up every morning, go out and try to find a job. And if we cannot find a job, we just fast that day. The family did not eat. And, and so they were living day to day. That's one word. But the other word for poverty is a word that indicates someone that is so poor that uh, he has zero. He doesn't have a job. He doesn't have anything at all. And the Lord says, church at Smyrna, I know what's going on. Now, where could that have come about? What about Hebrews chapter 10, verse 34, where Paul writes to Jew, or where somebody writes to Jewish Christians, and he says, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You had a possession, you had a house, had a car, and all of a sudden, it's all taken from you. Those Bahamian brethren who are here tonight, you understand how that happened overnight? And, and, and that's what they, and, and yet whenever, because of their faith in God, those pagans came in and took away every possession that they had. Listen to James, James chapter 2, verse 5. Hath not God chosen the rich, or the, the poor of this world, who are rich in faith? And look at this, this verse in Revelation. They think you're poor, but you are rich. And the poorest Christian is richer than the richest man on this earth. You have a treasure that excels the treasure of Bill Gates. And that is you have a saved soul. And you have a God that has his providence and has his eyes over you and his ears open to your prayer. But he says, you know the blasphemy of those who say that they are Jews and are not. They're the synagogue of Satan. What does that indicate? The word blasphemy just simply means to speak against. And so in, in Smyrna, there was a large Jewish uh, population that was there. Uh, it, uh, the, the secular history indicates that some of them were really, really wealthy in that city. Some of the Jews were wealthy in that city. And, uh, <coughs> and, and so they were talking about the Christians and speaking against. Now you imagine Paul on his missionary journeys when he arrived in the city and the whole city was in uproar. Christians in the first century, because they were so different from that world, they often created situations that people would speak against them. Listen, young people, write this verse on your heart. Luke 6, 46, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. I want you to write that on your hearts. Young adults, I want you to write something on your hearts. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. There's no way that you can live the Christian life and be visible with your Christian life without other people speaking evil of you. And so the Bible says, woe to them. And so here are these individuals, and they are Jews. The persecution early <coughs> in, in, in the book of Acts came from Jewish sources. We'll study that uh, in, in, in that Sunday morning class. But we've overlooked the fact that there are 21 persecutions in the book of Acts, and 20 of them come from the Jews. Our mindset is it was the Romans tried to destroy Christianity. The Romans tried to destroy Christianity. That's not the situation. Divine history shows that the persecution was Jewish. And here's one of those, here's part of that indication. And then the Lord says, they say they are Jews. What does that mean? Well, a Jew would be one who, are, who would be God's chosen people. Is that not the language you, that we use sometimes to describe uh, God's, the Jewish nation in the Old Testament? But what does the New Testament say uh, about those who are God's chosen people? It says, he is not a Jew who is outward, a Jew outwardly, who has circumcision of the flesh. In the first century, that's how 
Jews were delineated from those who were not Jews, whether they were circumcised or not, as a religious act. And so the Bible says, <coughs> when Christianity comes along, he is not a Jew who is a Jew outwardly. It's not circumcision in the flesh. This is Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. It is that individual who has, who has circumcised his heart. You see, it's not fleshly circumcision that does away with parts of the flesh. The spiritual circumcision that amounts is when we take the evil that is in our heart and cut it away from our hearts. That is the one who is a Jew. In Christ Jesus, Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 and 29, says there is no uh, Jew or Gentile in the church. This does not exist. No male nor female, no, no, uh, no slave man and no free man. And then he says, <coughs> if, if you belong to Christ, all of that doesn't matter one iota. And then he says, but if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Who are the true Jews in Smyrna? And the statement that is made uh, in Romans and the statement that is made in Galatians and, and, uh, and in, in 1 Corinthians, that uh, circumcision is nothing at all throughout the Bible, is stated right here. They say they are Jews, but they're not. <coughs> and then listen to the plainness of this. And in this age, day and age of political correctness, where the world says, don't you ever be critical of anything. One of the characteristics of the millennial age is, well, don't you ever say anything. You just accept everybody as, as, as to where they are. Don't you be tolerant and you just, just be nice to everybody and don't you ever say anything critical of anybody. You do that politically and you are dead. You know, whenever some movie star all of a sudden it begins to manifest some faith or religion, religion in his life, all of a sudden he's, he, he's, he's just you know, pushed out of that, of that culture. You and I need to understand that it, woe to us when all men speak well of us. But he says, and listen to this, lack of political correctness. Down on that street named Golden, it's possible there could have been maybe several Jewish synagogues. There might have been, I'm sure there were other streets, but on the, all over that city, at least some place on one of those cities, we know there was a synagogue. Guess what the Lord saw when he saw that synagogue? It's not synagogue devoted to God. It's not a synagogue of Jehovah Almighty. The Lord says it's a synagogue of Satan. We need to speak plainly enough so people will understand that there is right and there is wrong, and that there is a way of delineating, deciding what is right and what is wrong. Then he says, but don't you be afraid. I know your works, and you've got nothing to be afraid of, afraid of even about the things that you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about ready to cast some of you into prison. Now, when you read that, don't see the devil, you know, with his little pitchfork and, and, and you know, in, in his red suit and point, pointed uh, uh, horns on, on, on his head and a, and, a, and, a, and a red tail that runs out, to, out behind him. All Satan does is use evil men. But he says, tell you what's going to happen. This tribulation, the rock that's being rolled upon you, Satan's behind it. It may not be true of all persecutions and all tribulations that come into our life, but these folks in Smyrna knew that there were some things that were about to happen, and it is there that you might be tested, and then he says, and you will have tribulation ten days. If you've been in the church in Smyrna, and you'd read, you're going to have tribulation ten days. How long would it have taken you to figure out if that 10 days is literal or figurative? We don't know. But if you'd been in the church in Smyrna, 
How long would it have taken you to find out whether this is a literal 10 days or the word 10 days used in some symbolic way? I don't know when I'd figured it out. Day 11. Day 11. And do I need to know whether it's literal or figurative? No. They knew, they experienced it does not seem like a long period of time to us in reference to some other of the times that are, that, that are mentioned uh, in this book. But he says it's, it, 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 it is only going to be for 10 days. This too shall pass. Whatever's happening in your life. Real great problems, you know, reaching maturity, young people, as you try to figure out what life is all about, and you run through all those trials you meet as a young adult in, 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 uh, in this world. Let me tell you what somebody said, the most wonderful words in the Bible. And the words are, it came to pass. Somebody says, what, why is that? What if the Bible said it came to stay? And so the message is to these saints, you, the devil's about to come in and cast you into prison for 10 days, but it's going to end. And then the last part of that verse, you've seen Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. You be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. There were crowns that were given in the Olympics and in other games, and Smyrna was a place where they, you know, sometimes they held every four years, by the way, they had, the, uh, uh, within a period of time, could have been five years, but the Romans held that which amounted to Olympics, and, and they, were, they moved from city to city every year, sort of like we do with our Olympics in our day, except the head of the city was an individual who was a pagan, and he demanded that everybody in the city support him as he served his God, putting all of these games on. Been rough to be a Christian, wouldn't it? Cannot be in the trade yells, and, and, and you'll be looked at as being, as, as, as being a rebel. Let, let me read uh, something uh, to you about the death of one of, the, one of the early Christians. On Saturday, February the 23rd, 155 A.D., in the city of Smyrna, it was the time of the public games, the city was crowded, and the crowds became excited. Suddenly, the shout went up, away with the atheist. In a pagan world, guess who atheists are? That's us. And one of the elders in that in the city of Smyrna was a man by the name of Polycarp. He was known by, the, by those in there, and they saw that he, they knew that he was a Christian. Let's get, away, get all of these atheists out of Smyrna. Let Polycarp be searched for. Polycarp could have escaped, but, but, but uh, he decided not to. His whereabouts was betrayed by a slave who was tortured until they told where Polycarp, Polycarp was. They came to arrest him. He ordered that they should be given a meal, give them all the food they wanted, while he asked for himself the privilege of praying for one hour. Not even the police captain, the captain of the guard, wished to see Polycarp die. On the brief journey to the city, he pled with the old man, what harm, Polycarp, is it simply to say, Caesar is Lord? And then offer a sacrifice, and your life will be spared. Situation ethics. Polycarp was adamant that for him only Jesus Christ was Lord. When he entered the arena, there was a massive stadium that was there, some, somewhat like our football stadiums. There's, uh, the ruins of that stadium are still uh, in, in, uh, in that area. They, uh, uh, Polycarp entered into that arena. The proconsul, the ruler, gave him the choice of cursing the name of Christ and making a sacrifice to Caesar or death. Listen to this. 
Polycarp said, 80 and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul threatened him with burning, and Polycarp said, You threaten me with the fire that burns for a time and is quickly quenched. For you do not know the fire which awaits the wicked in the judgment to come and in everlasting punishment. Why are you waiting? Come do your will. And there is one account that said he even helped them gather the firewood. When they were ready to tie him to the stakes, they were going to bind him to that stake. And he says, leave me alone, for he who has given me power to endure the fire will grant me the ability to remain inside the fire unmoved, even without the security of the ropes that you want to place upon me. So they left him loosely bound, and Polycarp gave his life. Letters to Seven Churches in Asia. It's a book of revelation to seven churches in Asia in symbols of things which must shortly happen. And the more we understand about that first century world and what they were enduring in their faith and in their fidelity to the Lord, the greater will our ability be to understand the depths of the meanings of some of these things found in this book. Revelation 2.10, be thou faithful unto death. Are you a faithful Christian? First of all, are you a Christian? The Bible says that to be a Christian you want to be saved, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Have you been baptized? Why would you walk out of this building not being a baptized believer? One saved, one added to the body of Jesus. The other question is, are you a faithful Christian? He does not say be perfect, and by that I mean sinless. He does not say you live a perfect life and you can go to heaven. No, you live a life that's characterized by faithfulness. And whenever you slip up, you do something to correct the mistakes that that you've made in your life. And until the day that you die, I don't know how old Polycarp was when he died. There are not many people that I know that's been a Christian for 86 years. But here's this old man who very early in his life decided, I want to be a Christian. And he served him for 86 years. I commend all of you young people for the fact that you thought soberly about your relationship to the Lord. And if you live to be 100 years of age, 95 years of age, you might be able to say, 80 and 6 years have I served him, and never one time has he ever left me down. If you're not a Christian, you don't have that assurance. You're on your own. You can walk out of this building on your own or you can walk out of this building with the Lord being beside you, one who knows your works. It's your decision. And if there are changes you need to make in your life, let us know how we can help you make those changes by coming to the front right now as together we stand and sing.